With iTrust Capital, you can actually invest in crypto without worrying about taxes or fees. iTrust Capital allows their clients to invest in crypto through an individual retirement account or an IRA. IRAs are tax-sheltered accounts, which means all your crypto trading is tax-free and even can grow tax-free over time. The process of signing up with iTrust Capital is really easy and the service is awesome. The platform has dedicated client experience team and you can tell that they really care about helping. The best part is it's totally free to open an account and there are no hidden fees. The platform also offers a growing list of over 25 different cryptocurrencies to invest in, with more being added all the time, so it's easy to diversify your portfolio. If you use my link itrust.capital slash Darren, you can get up to $100 in funding bonus just by using my link, so be sure to check them out. Our worst enemies are not the ignorant and simple, however cruel. Our worst enemies are the intelligent and corrupt. I would say if you look back in history, uh, mm. the times at which a dominant currency was displaced, it was always a bit of an accident that brought it. It's not like a smooth trend that like, eventually brings it to parity. Something happens in the world, it's a crisis, it's a war, and that catalyzes a major change. So these processes, I think, are probably going to be very nonlinear. Uh, at the same time, I think it's hard to uh, imagine that it would happen in the next couple of years. It's clearly something yeah. that's a bit in the future. Well, let's hope we can reach to that stage with, without a war. That would be really, uh, really hope. <laughs> nice, nice signal of hope that you're giving us. <laughs> now, recall The global monetary system is broken, and something has to end for something to begin. From destruction comes creation. I, I think we are not paying sufficient attention to the law of unintended consequences. We take decisions with an objective in mind and rarely think through what may happen that is not our objective. Uh, and then uh, we wrestle uh, with, the, with the impact of it. Um, take uh, any, any, any decision that is a massive decision like uh, the decision that we need to spend to support the economy. And at that time, we did recognize that may lead to too much money in circulation, too few goods, but didn't really quite think through the consequence in a way that upfront would have informed better uh, what, what we do. And I subscribe entirely what, to what... Uh, uh, Christine said about uh, climate shocks. We are already out of time. And the uh, fact that whenever something hits us, we forget about this other crisis is inc incredibly troubling. The fact that we are, I'm sorry I'm going on here, but I'll finish in a second. <laughs> we act sometimes like eight years old playing soccer. Here is the ball, we are all at the ball, and we don't cover the rest of the field. Our ability to deal with more than one crisis at one time is very, very uh, limited. And we have to zero in on the really big things that would determine the future and keep our attention uh, on them. Uh, when uh, the um, war started, my daughter calls me a week later and says, Mom, what happened with the pandemic? It disappeared from media. We didn't pay any attention. It is still with us. So we have unintended consequences of actions and we have insufficient attention to cover the whole field. Kristalina states that maybe they didn't entirely think through inflating the money supply. Too much money and too few goods. They are reactionary and can only deal with one crisis at a time. We have a myriad of emergencies which paint the central banks into a corner. Inflationary pressures with a weakened economy. Inflate or deflate. Both options are bad and will have a bad outcome. To some frictions and uh, some shifts in uh, trading part, uh, partners. But I am in the both of those who say we are so integrated and if you make a list of the problems that no one country can resolve on its own it's a very long list 
we have to find ways to work together. So what is the question? Are we going to evolve in blocks that are closed and function independently from each other? Or we would have some preferences, trading, preferred trading partners, but we will have highways and bridges that allow us to still solve big problems, come on the same page. What was so interesting today in our discussions was how strong the voice of we have to work together was in the room. And it was especially emerging markets and developing economies that said, hey, we have achieved so much because of this integrated global economy. It is irresponsible to make the world poorer. And actually, Sri Mulyani spoke so well that it is the quality of our world, not just the quality of our economies mm -hmm. that is uh, at stake, but it is more difficult and it makes my job even more important in finding place for all of us uh, to agree. We live in a globalized economy. Every nation is dependent on each other in order to produce goods and services. With technology, this trend has continued and is beneficial to everyone. The issue is we do not have a level playing field. Larger countries have advantages in this system. monetary system. So today, the dominance of the dollar makes the U.S. the world's banker. In such, as such, it enjoys exorbitant privileges, in the words of Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, but it also bears exorbitant duties. Directly and indirectly, it's the dominant supplier of safe and liquid assets to the rest of the world. It is the issuer of a dominant currency of trade invoicing. It is the dominant force in global monetary policy, and it is the main lender of last resort. And these features actually interact and reinforce each other. That the dollar dominates in trade invoicing makes it more attractive to borrow in dollars. And this, in turn, makes it more attractive to price in dollars. That the US is the main lender of last resort makes it safer to borrow in dollars. And this, in turn, increases the responsibility of the US in times of crisis. So all these factors solidify the position, the special position of the US in the current system. At the same time, not all is well in this dollar-centric international monetary system. There's a growing and seemingly insatiable global demand for safe assets. And the resulting global safe asset shortage has brought safe interest rate downs to a historically low levels and has really catalyzed very serious and very persistent challenges to macroeconomic stability by increasing the probability of hitting the zero lower bound and to financial stability by pushing investors to lever up, to take risks, to reach for yield. It had also created the conditions of what some people called a new Triffin dilemma. So the only way over the long run for the US to accommodate this growing global demand for safe assets is to stretch its fiscal and financial capacity, to strain the trust that investors confer on the dollar, and to risk creating instability and crisis. In 1960, Robert Triffin wrote a paper called The Triffin Dilemma. He points out that having a world reserve currency is unsustainable. The U.S. will be in perpetual trade deficits and will not be able to service domestic policy because global policy will contradict, meaning the U.S. dollar will inflate away, but the Fed cannot raise interest rates because it will crush the global economy due to every country's dependence on dollars. This is what we are seeing today. As the Fed raises interest rates, smaller nations are crushed. So the international community can take concrete steps to prepare for these challenges. And I think the most actionable priority is to strengthen the global financial safety net. So some of that involves uh, preserving and strengthening the ability of central banks and governments to act as lender of last resorts in their own countries. Some measures involve creating decentralized arrangements between countries, such as reserve sharing agreements and bilateral swap line agreements between central banks. And finally, 
other measures involve strengthening the existing facilities and the financial capacity of the international institution at the center of the international monetary system, the IMF. And we can do that while at the same time increasing the support of the IMF to the decentralized system. These two things are complementary. And perhaps more radically, we can imagine uh, a new expanded role for the IMF by uh, adapting and modernizing some old ideas of what's called the Keynes plan and the Trifin plan. For example, you could imagine that the IMF could centralize reserve sharing agreements by administering a new uh, global reserve facility at the IMF, perhaps building on the existing special drawing right. The IMF could also try to multilateralize the decentralized, sparse, and largely discretionary network of bilateral swap lines, either by acting as a center or counterparty clearinghouse for these bilateral swap lines and absorbing some of the counterparty risk, or by offering itself its own short-term swap facility. And Ricardo, in his presentation, is going to develop some of these ideas uh, in great details. So to conclude, uh, let me quote the late MIT economist Rudiger Donbush, who said that in economics, things think uh, uh, longer to happen than you think they will, but they happen a lot faster than you thought they could. John Maynard Keynes was an economist, and every central banker today is a Keynesian economist that subscribes to his economic theory. The Keynes plan discussed the idea of a bankor. This is a jurisdictionless asset that is free from one country's monetary policy. The Bancor replaces the dollar as the reserve currency and is able to inflate and deflate without crippling the issuing nation's economy. We are living in a world of distrust and decentralization is a technology that eliminates the need for trust. Today's system heavily relies on trust and this is where the problems come into play. With trustless systems, no one country is responsible for global monetary policy. All nations depeg from each other. They have a lot of companies, they are open their branches here in UAE, the, in Dubai, or in Abu Dhabi, like the MCC, the FCC, the MG. And uh, even the uh, UAE government, they are adopting the cryptocurrency, some services for the government, they are using the cryptocurrency as a payment gateway. I think the UAE it will be leader in the Middle East in this. And the future, uh, we never know what's happened. I think in the later uh, Europe and US in the future, they will uh, have their regulation. When time comes, I think uh, all the world will use this cryptocurrency. The UAE government is adopting crypto and is using it as a payment gateway. Ripple has made a lot of traction in the MENA region. Dr. Zaid Halhamari thinks when the time is right, the U.S. will jump on board to this digital paradigm. Uh, when Christine was uh, the managing director here in 2018, early 2019, in these good days that we almost forgot existed, she would say, when the sun is shining, fix, fix the roof. The roof. Mm -hmm. What we are now discovering is that many countries did not fix the roof when the sun is shining. Now it is pouring. Well, maybe now we get to fixing the roof. I How are they going to fix the roof? CPI is at 8.5%. The Fed fighting inflation means it crushes the global economy. At the same time, there is a restructuring of the global economy. You're watching the war in Ukraine unfold, you know, the special military operation in Ukraine unfold. Much of what you see in the Western media um, is, you know, kind of a, a pro-Ukraine propaganda. And you can, you, 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 whether, you, whether you're really on Ukraine's side or not, you just got to realize that, that that's what you're seeing. Do not be surprised uh, in the next, you know, month or two, uh, if and when this thing, you know, wraps up in a way that, uh, that that is surprising. You know, I, I, I was I was talking with one of my old Navy buds the other day. Uh, we were talking about the sinking of that cruiser last week, you know, where they yeah. put those two missiles into the side, blew it up and went down to the bottom of the Black Sea. Um, you know, a lot, a lot, first of all, it shows you that, you know, surface fleets are, you know, fairly obsolete these days if you if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, but secondly, that, that may have been the moment in the war of peak Ukraine. Um, they, you know, peak Ukraine, Ukraine fought off the Russians around Kiev. Now they have a huge battle out in the east, and I, I don't, I don't know how 
the Ukrainians as a spent military force at this point can prevail against the Russians. I, I th This war is going to come to an end. The sooner the better. They're going to redraw the map. Russia's going to get a big whack of it. Uh, will the world go along with Russia and somehow, you know, desanction things and pull yeah. back and, and try to try to repair the damage to the dollar. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't trust our politicians to do the right thing. I don't know that they know how to do the right thing in so many ways. Uh, but uh, this, this, you know, watch this thing come to a surprising conclusion faster than what you think. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of finger pointing and recrimination. And um, the end of big wars, and this is a big war. It's a big war in so many ways. The end of big wars bring big changes. Uh, we're gonna change the map. We've, we've, we've changed the global alignment of the monetary system. The whole correlation of monetary forces has changed. And uh, a lot of things that you used to think were true aren't going to be true going forward. When this comes to a conclusion, we have more distrust, more fragmentation. In this environment, how does the world move forward? Trustless protocols will bridge international trade. National walled gardens bridged by the internet of value. Well, that is, that is certainly a possible outcome here. I think you've seen uh, questions about globalization, and this this uh, series of events around Ukraine certainly has the, the possibility of leading to a more fragmented political situation and economic situation. Uh, you saw Secretary Yellen's speech this week about, uh, about looking to, uh, I think she called it, friendshoring. So I think there's a lot of thinking going on like that. You know, the, the globalization that we had... Uh, had benefits to it and it had cost, cost in, involved in it. Lael Brainer has been confirmed as vice chair of the Fed. You, you, uh, you mentioned the speed of cross-border payments and the opaqueness of that process. And I, I guess there are, it's also error prone to some extent with SWIFT. Um, Santander seems to be trying to approach it with a partnership with a ripple. Just curious what your thoughts are on that. So um, I, I do think that of uh, the use cases out there, um, cross-border is one of the most compelling. Uh, we know that intermediation chains cross-border are long and uh, quite opaque, and they're slow, and uh, they can be quite costly. Um, so uh, my sense is that um, technology uh, with the appropriate safeguards um, could make a material impact and, and likely will. And it may well be through a partnership model. I don't want to pronounce on any particular approach, um, but there are a variety of partnerships out there that are trying uh, to innovate and to uh, reduce frictions and increase transparency for those cross-border transactions. In my sense, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic that there are some good solutions out there um, that don't necessitate a global uh, stable coin. Most things disappoint till you look deeper. Thanks everyone, I hope you enjoyed the show. Please take a moment to like and subscribe, and if you enjoy content like this and wish to support my channel, please consider joining my Patreon. Thanks.